Announcements first on the 23rd of January at 7 o'clock in the evening in Mishkanot Chananin, we will have uh, the Dan El Azar Memorial Lecture. Richard Joel, the president of the uh, Yeshiva University, will uh, speak about the future of education. And it will not be here as usual, but it will be at Mishkanot Chananin in. Imin Moshe on the 23rd, Sunday the 23rd, at, uh, at 7 o'clock. Second thing is we just published an uh, interview with Ed Beck of Scholars for Peace in the Middle East on uh, the role of faculty in the battle against anti-Israelism on the American campuses. You can find it there in the standard of uh, post-Holocaust and anti-Semitism, this by the way is also a subject Karl has extensively uh, published uh, on uh, in the Jewish Telegraph Agency publications. Uh, Karl needs little introduction here, I, I guess. He was the uh, editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post uh, for some time, uh, a number of years ago, and uh, before that, he was to visit the Jerusalem Post in many other functions, including the editing of the magazine, is, as far as I recall. Uh, and uh, he has recently produced this text. I guess it's on the web, Carl? It's on the web. It's on the uh, web of the American Jewish uh, Committee website, Ripples from the Mas Matzav, Grassroots Responses of American Jewry to the Situation in Israel. We have, of course, of organized jury, we have seen here a number of things since the starting of the second Palestinian uprising. Perhaps the most impressive thing we have seen here was when the U, uh, UJC held its General Assembly in November last year, and they marched, thousands marched through the streets of Jerusalem to show their identification uh, with Israel. That was, of course, not grassroots, but organized. We have seen the enormous investment by the Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, here in the, uh, in the Museum for Tolerance, which is probably the largest, I think it's the largest charitable uh, investment in Israel we have had, and Marvin Heyer has also clearly said that uh, it's a sign of identification with Israel of, of the center and that other organizations should do similar things in times when investment is uh, is uh, is low. Uh, well, I'll not keep you long. I'll ask uh, Carl to take it from here to uh, discuss this issue of what has changed in the reactions of American uh, jury to uh, to <coughs> Israel in the recent years and where that, uh, that may be uh, taking us in the future, Carl. <coughs> Thank you, Manfred. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Jerusalem Center and especially Dr. Gersenfeld for making this morning possible. I'd like to thank all of you for answering to an invitation that came very much at the last minute. Um, what I'd like to do is to talk about some of the 
I really like to offer some vignettes from the front lines, if you will, the front lines halfway around the world of American Jewry. The front lines of American Jews who have been um, exploring and questioning their connection to Israel, their involvement in Israel, their uh, understanding of events in Israel over the last four years. But really, we need to start a little earlier. We need to start about a decade earlier. In 1990, when the National Jewish Population Study was published in the United States, there was shock among many leaders in American Jewry who found that suddenly they were facing tremendous rates of intermarriage that they had always known had been there, but suddenly they were looking at numbers, which have since come into question, but they were looking at numbers showing more than half of Jews intermarrying. They were looking at tremendous questions related to issues of Jewish continuity in America. Right around the same time, the Oslo process got started here. Many American Jews looked to Israel and said, well, they're going to be fine. They've got a peace process going on. They've got all of this America, all of this Soviet Jewry coming in this wave of massive Aliyah that had started a couple of years earlier. Prosperity is on the way. Stability is on the way. Peace and security are on the way. Israel's going to be fine. We have problems right here at home. Many American Jews, many American Jewish leaders started to really turn inward, to focus on Jewish education, to focus on day schools, to focus on trying to enhance Jewish ac access to Jewish activities and Jewish programming on college campuses. The focus turned to American Jewish life in America. And that really went on for the better part of the 1990s. And as the high-tech boom seemed to be sweeping Israel up in it, as prosperity really was tangible, as the numbers of immigrants from the former Soviet Union reached a million, it looked as though American Jews were right in their own eyes. They were right to be focusing on their own issues at home because they had problems at home. All of this, and it's not really the place right now to question were their assumptions or their presumptions correct or not, but they had a wake-up call in the fall of 2000. The wake-up call, of course, came with the collapse of the Oslo process, the final collapse of the process, with the outbreak of the terror war, and all of a sudden, no American <coughs> Jew who cared at all, who was involved in an even peripheral way, no American Jew could ignore what was going on in Israel. No American Jew who cared at all about Israel could still lull himself into thinking that everything was going to be fine in Israel, that the Israelis don't need us anymore. Many American Jews, both on an organized level, the institutions, the organizations <coughs> of the American Jewish community, and perhaps even more impressively, on a grassroots level across <coughs> the country, woke up. Everybody had a different trigger. For some people, it was the lynching of two soldiers in October 2000 in Ramallah. For others, it was the killing of Kobe Mandel a few months later. For others, it was September 11th in the United States. Everybody had their own trigger. But many American Jews suddenly said, wait a minute. I can't say that Israel's fine. I can't say that Israel is going to do well on its own, and I don't need to worry about it. I do need to worry about it. Across the country, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individual Jews started looking for ways to respond. Shoshana Cardin, former chair of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, says very candidly that the organized Jewish community, the leadership, the institutions, the, the members of the Conference of Presidents, if you will, were very slow to respond to this sharp shift that came in the fall of 2000 and accelerated over the coming years that left a void, and it left many American Jews across the country looking for ways that they could be involved, looking for ways that they could do something, that they could make a difference, that they could try to help. Now at the same time, of course, there was something else happening. Because of the terror, tourism was dropping. So the most tangible, the most probably important way to build connections between American Jews and Israel suddenly seemed to be off limits. You could have fascinating conversations with passionate American Jews talking about their connection to Israel, talking about their concern for Israel, talking about 
everything that they needed to do to help Israel and how connected they were and all they did was eat, think, and breathe Israel. And you would ask them, well, have you been since the Matzav started? They kind of look down, they look around, they look anywhere but in your eyes and they'd say, well, no, I haven't been. My wife won't let me go, my this, my that, whatever, whatever. But we saw, we saw that the numbers of tourists plummeted. And last year when about a million tourists came, only one in four of them was Jewish. Now the truth is, there were never huge numbers of visits from American Jews. Only one in three American Jews have ever visited this country. But just after certain efforts had gotten underway at the end of the 90s to bring many more young Jews to visit Israel, to develop that personal connection, it all collapsed. Youth groups canceled their summer trips to Israel. They couldn't give away the free seats in the Birthright Israel program. Buses were going half empty. One bus was going where four or five or ten buses had gone the year before. American Jews were not visiting Israel. But on the ground, in the streets, whether in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in New York, in Baltimore, and in many smaller cities as well, American Jews were looking for ways to be involved. There emerged a wide range of startup grassroots advocacy and activist groups working on behalf of Israel. They run the gamut from political action organizations to cultural and social organizations to fundraising <coughs> to media monitoring a wide range of activities. Many of these activities of course had been carried out up until then by larger establishment organizations but many of the newcomers First, many of the newcomers didn't know that there existed a whole apparatus, didn't know what the organized Jewish community had to offer, and many others simply didn't feel comfortable in the framework of the establishment, in the framework of whether UJC or a local Jewish Community Relations Council or any number of other organizations, AJC, ADL, or any others that were doing all kinds of work on behalf of Israel. So we saw across the country a number of startups emerging. One of the most typical examples is from Los Angeles, where when Colby Mandel was bludgeoned to death, a woman by the name of Roz Rothstein was watching television, was watching the reports on CNN and wherever else she was watching, and she felt that something had reached here. She could not continue to watch this anymore. She could not continue to watch misrepresentations. She could not sit on the sidelines and not do anything. So Roz Rothstein, a woman in her early 50s who had been active in her synagogue, active in Jewish community centers, active in day schools, but had never done much for Israel, called everybody she knew. She called every Jewish organization she could think of in Los Angeles, and she had an emergency meeting in her living room. She called together about 40 people. They sat down one night in May of 2001, and they talked about what can we do to try to change this situation. What can we do to combat the bad media coverage of the conflict? What can we do to try to counter the impression that many Americans must be getting that Israel is the aggressor here, that the Palestinians are the oppressed? What can we do? So out of that meeting was born an organization called Stand With Us. It started out as little more than a website. It's expanded over the last three and a half years into a full-fledged advocacy and activist and education organization based in Los Angeles, working mainly on the West Coast, but with bits of activity in other places across the country. They focus extensively on campuses. They focus extensively on media monitoring and on holding media accountable for the way they're presenting issues related to the conflict. This is an organization that four years ago didn't exist. Three years ago, many people in the organized Jewish community in LA were saying, oh, it's a flash in the pan, it'll be gone. It's an organization that now has attracted hundreds of thousands of dollars in annual support, and it's an organization that holds national seminars in how to advocate for Israel, national seminars explaining the background and the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict. This is an organization that has touched the lives of tens of thousands of American Jews. There are other examples in many large and many small cities 
across the country. In Eugene, Oregon, often called the Berkeley of the North of the Pacific Northwest, a very left-leaning, very radical college town in Oregon. There have been a tiny Jewish community. There's a Hillel at the university. They've never done much related to Israel. Margot Helfand, member of the community, committed, travels to Israel on a pretty regular basis, woke up one day three years ago, called her rabbi, and said, we have to do something. They created the Jewish Community Relations Council of Eugene, Oregon. In many contexts, in many communities across the U.S., the JCRC focuses on a wide range of issues, domestic and international. Heavy emphasis on Israel, but a lot of other issues as well. In Eugene, 99% of what the JCRC does is focused on Israel. Whether they get together and group write op-eds for the local newspaper to try to put out Israel's position, to try to put out supportive ideas about Israel, or whether they work with the local schools to try to ensure that curriculum that focuses on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict provides a fair and balanced view of the conflict. These are people who, four or five years ago, were perfectly content to live in a tiny Jewish community, largely uninvolved, largely unconnected to Israel, and in these last three and a half years, they have become very tightly connected to Israel. When you look at some of the establishment organizations, the one that jumps right center stage has to be APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. APAC, over the last four years, has seen its membership grow by 50%. That's a direct response of American Jews. Obviously, there are non-Jewish members of APAC as well, but most of the members are Jews. It's a direct response by American Jews to the situation in Israel, to the sense that we have to do something. Now, a 50% increase is incredible, but we're talking about an increase from 55,000 members to 85,000 members. These are dues-paying members. Not all of them are active, although more than 4,000 do go to policy conference every year in Washington. One and a half percent of American Jews belong to APAC, and look at what APAC achieves. Here's where we come to a very interesting dichotomy, a very interesting question about the role of these advocacy efforts, about the role of American Jews in supporting Israel. <clears throat> Many argue that if an American Jew doesn't want to visit Israel, that if an American Jew is afraid to get on a plane and come here, that anything else he's doing is really more for himself than for Israel. I think it's an interesting point, and I think it bears exploration. When we look at APAC, representing or with members who count as about 1.5% of the American Jewish population, and we look at what APAC achieves, we look at the bipartisan support for Israel in Congress, we look at the strong relationship between Washington and Jerusalem, obviously not only because of APAC, but APAC plays a huge role in cementing and in burnishing that relationship. It doesn't take 50%, 90%, 100% of American Jews to ensure that the relationship between Washington and Jerusalem is strong. It doesn't take the involvement of every Jew in a community or every Jew across the United States to ensure that to ensure that media are being held accountable when they run misleading stories or photographs or headlines. It doesn't take the involvement of every American Jew. There's always been an issue among American Jews. There's always been a concern about continuity. There's always been a concern, a question, are we the last generation? When I spoke to Jeffrey Solomon, the president of the Andrea and Charles Bronfman Philanthropies, he said that when he took a senior post with the New York Jewish Federation back in 1986, he sat down and he read minutes from board meetings from the previous 75 years. At every board meeting, inevitably, there was a long discussion focusing on this question, are we the last generation? Will our children be involved after us? Will anybody still care? Will there be American Jews? Will American Jews care as a community? Obviously, 
back in 1917 and in 1925 and in 1930, the answer always was yes. That hasn't changed the focus among so many involved American Jews who continue to ask the same question. Will there be a next generation? Will anybody care? What we've seen these last four plus years as these grassroots startup organizations have popped up across the country, as tens of thousands of individuals who had never been involved with anything related to Israel have gotten involved, what we've seen is that they're looking for a way to continue. They're looking for a way to be a part of a bigger picture, a bigger Jewish picture that encompasses American Jewry, that encompasses diaspora Jewry in other countries, that encompasses Israel and Israeli Jewry. They're looking for a way, and many of them have come to the conclusion that the only way to achieve that, the only way to find that, is to build something themselves. Just a couple of examples. I mentioned Roz Rothstein and Stand With Us. A gentleman by the name of John Kerry in San Francisco got his wake-up call with September 11th. Suddenly he started seeing linkage between the attacks on America and America's relationship with Israel. He started to get very concerned living in the Berkeley area with all the posters and the bumper stickers, Free Palestine. He started to get very concerned that nobody was talking about Israel's rights, about Israel's legitimacy, about Israel's perspective in this conflict. He started, he's a designer by profession. He started to make some bumper stickers, he started to make some posters, he started to work with Hillel, he started to work with a number of other organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area. Not too much longer, he had attracted the attention of a couple of foundations, got hundreds of thousands of dollars of grant money, and has spent the last three years mounting ongoing bumper sticker and postcard and leafleting campaigns, putting out messages, positive messages, about what's going on in Israel. He's not the only one. Israel 21C is another organization that was born as a result of the collapse of the peace process, that was born as a result of this sense, all of a sudden, that American Jews weren't doing very much and that the general American opinion about Israel was in danger. So Israel 21C, established initially by a couple of Israeli high-tech entrepreneurs based in Silicon Valley, has focused on trying to get news, other news, from Israel into American media. Israel Beyond the Conflict is their slogan, and what they do is they try to focus on stories about scientific developments, about humanitarian efforts. When Christopher Reeve visited here a couple of years ago, they were instrumental in getting extensive television and newspaper coverage around the world of that visit. They've been very successful. They've been very successful in placing stories in major media outlets across the United States and around the world. They've been very successful in interesting foreign correspondence based here in Israel to explore stories that don't have to do with checkpoints and don't have to do with curfews and don't have to do with targeted killings. No one is suggesting that those stories aren't legitimate. No one is suggesting that those stories shouldn't be covered. But what Israel 21C is doing, and a number of other organizations as well, is trying to expand the focus, trying to remind the American public that there's more to Israel than the Arab-Israeli conflict, that there's more to Israel than the terror war. They've enjoyed great success. Now, all of these individual efforts, as they crop up, usually in a completely uncoordinated manner, sometimes have aroused the ire, might be a little too strong of a word, but the concern or the skepticism of many leaders in the Jewish establishment, whether local federations, national organizations, local JCRCs, many have felt that it was competition. Many have felt that these startups should actually, the people who were launching them, should have found their place under the big tent of American Jewish communal life. That led to a situation where often, rather than coordination and cooperation, there was competition between startups and the establishment in communities across the country. 
There's been a lot of deliberation in federations and in JCRCs across America. How do we work with them? What do we do? How do we reach out to them? Again, Shoshana Cardin told me that she thinks, and she's not alone in this, startups bring new energy. Startups bring a lot of enthusiasm. Startups bring a different perspective because for the most part, they're being run by people who haven't been involved for 20 or 30 or 40 years in American Jewish life. So the people who are coming up with ideas of what to do for Israel are not burdened by the experience of every decision that's been made over previous years, of every strategy that's been debated. They come in with a fresh look and they try new things. But startups often are underfunded, often are completely unfunded. The best example that I can offer of that is a wonderful effort that got started in Los Angeles three years ago, an effort to leaflet and try to change public opinion on college campuses in Southern California about the Arab-Israeli conflict, to try to change ideas about Israel's legitimacy. This effort got together with a little bit of support from the LA Jewish Federation and a little bit of support from a couple dozen people in the Hollywood film industry, entertainment industry. They did a few trial runs in Southern California on four campuses. They put up a website. Very exciting. Everybody thought this was wonderful. They had great results on the four campuses that they leafleted on. The focus groups that they held among non-involved Jewish students on these four campuses. They found some points that seemed to speak to these Jewish students who were not involved, that seemed to encourage in them an interest in getting more involved. They seemed to be onto some things that Hillel hadn't managed to strike up, that none of the other organizations, none of the other dozens of organizations working on campuses had managed to get going. And then they disappeared. And when I talked a number of months ago to one of the founders of this little organization, he said, oh, well, we've all moved on to different things. I talked to another one of the founders, and he said, well, we expected that Hillel would see what we were doing and say, wow, this is wonderful, and they would adopt it, and they would pick it up, and they would spread it across the country, and they would roll it out on a national basis. But they didn't. And when I asked people at Hillel and at the Israel on Campus Coalition, what about this little startup? They said, you know, they've done some good work. They have some nice statistics. They have some nice data from their four pilot programs, but there's a lot of efforts out there, and we can't adopt every one of them. So the challenge becomes trying to draw in the enthusiasm and the interest and the creativity of the uninvolved, of the unaffiliated, of people who hadn't been doing anything related to Israel, but at the same time to try to find a way for them to work together with the establishment so that their good ideas will be able to be rolled out in a broad way, and so that the involvement of these thousands of individuals in so many different communities across the country isn't dependent on a small startup organization that may or may not survive. If you get real involved in Stand With Us or the David Project or Right to Exist or any of these other startups across the country, and the startup stops doing anything, as in the case of Right to Exist, which was a Chicago-based startup pro-Israel advocacy organization, where does that leave you? Your organization is dead. Nobody in the establishment is coming and offering you a role in what they're doing. The great fear is that many people for whom a spark was lit these last four years will find themselves going back to their former lives. Richard Wexler